this research has been uh, done in collaboration with Barack. However, he couldn't be here today. Um, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, okay, who am I? I'm a part of also with uh, Threat Research Group. Uh, before that, I published some works in runtime verification of all things um, before I moved to security. So you might know me uh, from UBC's container scan and Falco bypasses, uh, various blocks on uh, Kubernetes security, etc. I'm also using Unix and Eurus's artifact evaluation uh, committee member. Uh, that's because I'm a firm believer in uh, bridging the gaps between academic research and industry, and I, I think we're not doing this enough. All right, what's the talk is about? The premise. Um, the core Kubernetes cluster components are a necessity, well, clearly, otherwise how would you run the cluster without the API server? That's nonsense. Uh, users workloads, of course, also are a necessity because otherwise why would you stage the cluster? However, what about everything else? And by everything else, I mean stuff that comes free in the cluster, uh, in the managed cluster particularly, right? Like. Everything around the logs, exporters, CSI drivers, metrics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Something that's not uh, doesn't is not necessary for for the existence of the cluster. However, something that's very critical to operate the production level cluster. Otherwise, like, it's going to be really tricky. So the examples are, for example, container watcher on GKE, OSM controller on EKS, AWS node on EKS, but not Kube proxy because Kube proxy for uh, where I stand, I stand, this is integral part of the Kubernetes control plane, right? And Core DNS, for example, also. This is like, we must have it. Uh, okay, and the, the, you, there are various lists of those add-ons slash middleware slash plugins, so that's like, there are, there are multiple names for that. However, there's no centralized source for those components. So we'll start, we'll, we'll try to make some order in, in this. In numbers, in, temp in terms of numbers, if you stage GK, AKS, or EKS cluster V1.25, you'll get by default 25 uh, daemon sets, replica sets, or stateful sets in the, mostly of them, most of them in the cube system namespace, of course. Um, and I'm only considering native Kubernetes components because there are more host level components as well. Um, and in addition, yeah, so basically we get, we get a bunch of those. Um, okay, so now uh, as we, we're clear on the definition, let's, let's go with the premise. We have, uh, of course, this is a cloud security talk, so as every cloud security talk, we must start with the shared responsibility model. However, let's take this model from the cloud, from the wider cloud, to the Kubernetes space, okay? And we can see that there's a horizontal separation between master nodes and worker nodes, but there's also a vertical separation, right? We have control plane. Uh, marked as blue, we have green cust uh, customer workloads and everything in between, right? So virtual machine uh, hardware, this is clear. Okay, this is uh, CSP responsibility, we're good. But what about that middleware? The stuff that's in, in the middle. And the problem here is that we see that middleware is running as part of the master nodes and worker nodes. So this separation where we think about us customers as right now, we are responsible for worker nodes and CSP is respons responsible for master nodes. This separation is not clear, okay? And the boundaries are blurred here. And the, the most obvious problem is upgrade, right? Because cluster users focus on workload security, not control plane and not the middleware. However, the vulnerability patching process is unclear. And like if we, if we talk about the previous research from about cluster gray zone in the cloud, right? In the context of the cloud, the, where our vulnerability research group found some vulnerability in the OMI agent in Azure. However, it wasn't clear who's supposed to fix that, whether it's a customer's responsibility or CSP. And similar problems we have in our managed clusters. Two scenarios. First, CSP wants to upgrade but requires user action. Of course, like if you're running a production cluster, you know that upgrade of the worker nodes is not a trivial action. Second scenario, user wants to upgrade, but the component, but the component is controlled by CSP. So like, they, they can't, so we're, we're in a problem here. Okay, before we go further, let's adjust the expectations. Now we're gonna talk the serious business. Uh, this is not a scope of vulnerability research. This is not a security audit of Kubernetes components. And this talk is not about the threat model. Okay, but it is a bit of everything above. 
And more importantly, this is a risk assessment of previously unnoticed surface. And initial attempt to draw conclusions, call, call to arms, you name it. Okay, now let's start with the hypothesis. First, middleware increases attack surface. Good enough? Well, not good enough, because really every software increases attack surface, surface right? So this is kind of a triviality. Let's try this one. Middleware increases attack surface significantly. But then you might ask, what is significantly? What does this mean? How about this one? Middleware increases risk in a non-trivial way. And I think this is a good one because ultimately, we as a cluster operators, we're interested to know what's the risk in the cluster, right? And non-trivial way, I know it's a bit fluffy, but at least it has the leeway to, to interpret for interpretation. So let's run with this. What do we need to do to confirm or disprove the hypothesis? Well, we need a method in perform. So what we did, we performed analysis, we did our back and permissions analysis, image analysis, security posture config, behavioral runtime and logs, etc., etc. Out of it, we received security risk assessment. Great. So let's let's go into details. First of all, basic security posture. Out of those 25 deployments, uh, about a third of them actually run shared Linux namespaces. It's not ideal, right? Because this is, you know, the, the shared Linux namespaces, that means that there's more attack surface and more connection points between the container and the kernel. Not ideal, but hey, sometimes we need to do this. A third of those have privileged containers or containers with added capabilities beyond the default Kubernetes set. Okay, so that could be NetBind, Ptrace, you name it. And an additional third of them have mounted sensitive host volumes. So what does this mean? It's not just slash var log, whatever, something not interesting. It's either host or slash etc or something slash c, something, something juicy like that. So we can see that the, the footprint is pretty serious. Like the, in terms of privileges, these workloads, the middleware workloads, they, they require quite serious privileges here. Intuitively, it's kind of okay because they probably need this to do, but it, it gives a sense of uneasiness, right, about their, the impact, right? Because after all, risk is probability times impact. So this is impact. Image analytics, okay. Middle, middleware images have lots of vulnerabilities. Well, what else is new, right? Yeah, it's a couple, couple examples here. Here we see like 182 vulnerabilities, okay, great. However, so do the core images in control plane. And in addition, in general, number of vulnerabilities is proportional to number of packages. And so, really, we cannot state that middleware images are worse off than core components. Not for the good reason, just because core, core components also suck. But hey, uh, like we didn't want to go into the statistical analysis to, to, to claim that they, are, they have more vulnerabilities. So we left it at that. But instead, we, we went into the behavioral analysis. So there's a runtime stuff, right? Like looking at ptrace, what are they actually doing? And logs. And logs are a very interesting source because it can show stuff like unexpected principles acting, unexpected permissions, or discrepancies between the CSPs. If you think about it, even the same component acting differently in between the CSPs, that evidence of something either, I don't know, either differences in the behavior or in the source code or something, something interesting, basically. So I hope you can see this. This is an, an example of AKS. I think it's Log Explorer. Um, this is the event uh, execution into the pod by AKS problem detector. So here's the username. And what it does, it execs into the connecti connectivity agent on AKS. And this was the clue that we have apparently in AKS no problem detector. Before that, I didn't know what's this. So if you, let's say you run an AKS and GKE, you might have uh, not known this, but you also run node problem detector. And that's gonna be the star of our use case one. So um, in short, node problem detector is like health checker on steroids. It basically runs a bunch of checks on the node and tells us if everything is good or bad. Well, not us, to the API server. And there's a parent repo, but AKS and GKE, they run their own. Okay, like they, they modify the upstream report and we don't have access to that source. Um, the interesting part is that starting 
at some version, MPD, no problem detector, runs as a host service, and not as a daemon set. In IKEA, EKS, according to best practices guide, they still recommend to install the daemon set deployment. But on IKEA CGK, it runs as a host service. So I'll let it sync. There's a component in your AKS GK cluster that acts on the Kubernetes level. It executes into pods. And at the same time, it runs as a host service, as a process, root process. And it runs periodically. So this is how it looks on the, on the node. Um, this is GK, I think. This is AKS. You can see that uh, there is not problem detector process and pick, it's picking a bunch of uh, configs. Um, and in terms of versioning, the latest version is V1. Point, sorry, 8.12, I think, or 8.13. And we can see that AKS and GK V1.25, they're running 0 0.0810, which is a bit old, kind of old, like one and a half year. So not ideal, but hey. All right. So feature on the scope, how can we exploit this component, right? That's, that's the point of this presentation. Feature on the scope, drum roll, custom plugin monitor. That's a feature that extends the core functionality of the MPD um, and basically lets us to define new health checks. And this is the uh, chain of attack that we will perform in the next slide. So we'll see the demo. And then I'll, I'll stop and analyze the attack, right? We are going through from the, from the ability to write the script into the uh, certain folder. No problem detector pick, picks it up. And then we're getting all kinds of bounties in terms in, in the form of uh, persistency and periodic execution. All right, so demo number one. Uh, you might recognize the guestbook app, PHP app, from uh, GKE tutorials. So I modified it a bit. We can see the, uh, the front end Redis follower, so very, very realistic, I hope. And the problem with the front end, well, I guess it's a minor problem because it just it, it maps slash itsy. It's, it's okay, right? Because slash it's is like it keeps configuration on the host. So it, I guess it needed the configuration. So it mapped the slash it's on the host. And that's what we're going to explore. Um, so we have the load balancer feeding the IP outside. And this is how we can access that application. So like just regular message and service, I guess. But the thing is that there is a guestbook PHP file as well there. And um, there is a like unsanitized uh, parameter there called store that actually allows us uh, to perform the RC. There we go. So we can run ls uh, slash and attacker sees this one. So I didn't do env and stuff, but attacker can easily understand that this is a pod and this is it's running AKS. So this looks interesting. It's a host config. That's the name of the uh, slash etc actual host config. And attacker just goes into the place where NPD expects to see plugins, lists the plugins, and sees, oh, this is really AKS worker node. So we can, let's see what we can do with that. And we, they can even dump this uh, the plugin. This is how plugins, the, the actual, actual works. This is just bash script. Now the problem because the, the container runs as root, so of course they can update these batch trees and that's what we're gonna do. So I saved you the pain uh, of watching me updating this file through echo through the, uh, <laughs> through the URL line, but this is the, uh, this is the final result. You can see that we are doing the, we're cutting the token and namespace certain token from var lib kubelet and sending it to the C2 server. Okay, that's, that's the point here. And on this screen, I'm staging my C2 screen, uh, server. So once I update that uh, specific check terminate.sh script, that runs every minute. So there are pl there's additional folder of plugins.json that define how those scripts run. And they run periodically with certain period periodicity. And there we go. This is C2, and we're getting the token. 
and the cube system. And this one, I think, actually, OSM controller token, which is pr pretty powerful. So, so, so from this point on, we can, uh, from outside, we can go to the API server and use this token and just uh, own, the, uh, own the pod. So this part, this varlib kubelet, uh, remember that this stuff executed by the node problem detector, not by the pod. It wasn't executed from the pod. It was executed from the node by node problem detector. That's how it got the uh, access to the uh, varlib kubelet, because the pod itself didn't have that. All right. All right. So let's let's see what what we had here. We we started with we can start with the escape, right? We, we can start with the container escape, but we don't need to. We don't even need compromise manage because we can we can exploit some kind of misconfiguration and file writing ability of the pod. Okay, and this can happen in any pod in the cluster. Why? Because node problem detector is sort of like a daemon set. It runs on every worker node. So one mistake in one of the worker nodes is enough. Okay, and then we write in the script. We uh, node problem detector immediately, pretty much immediately, picks up a plugin, and then we have the periodic execution as a root to do st nasty stuff like dot ssh, basically establish persistence, and eventually spread to other nodes. And through usage of the tokens, right? Um, now, the interesting part here is that first, this all happens under the radar of API server. So what's the consequences? There is no audit trace, and admission controller is blind to this attack because it happens underneath the radar of API server. And probably we will bypass the EDR because no problem detector is known to all the EDR solution, otherwise, they would, it would generate a bunch of uh, false positives. So if you ask me, this is pretty cool. This is kind of, I guess, it can be described as a Kubernetes privilege escalation from writing into a certain folder in the pod context to owning all the nodes. OK, let's move on. Um, use case two, Fluent Bit. OK, Fluent Bit, I bet everybody knows this. Um, a very popular log management platform, and it's installed, it's installed on every GKE cluster, and you can install it according to EKS best practices. You install it from upstream. Uh, latest versions is 1.8.12. Okay, this is not very interesting, but what's interesting is the feature that we're going to exploit, the exact input plugin. With such a juicy name, of course, we couldn't uh, let it stay, uh, and so we're going to use uh, this construct. So for those of you, of you who never use FluentBit, it basically the config consists of a bunch of sections, input sections, that define the source of the logs, then parser and filter sections that define the actions with the logs, and then the output sections that actually say where to send the logs. And this uh, nasty plugin input, basically instead of defining the source of the logs, you can just perform command. In this case, ls slash wars log. But of course, we're not interested in the logs. We're interested in something more serious. And that's the attack flow. We will update the config map that used by FluentBit. FluentBit will pick up this malicious config. And uh, because the cluster will shrink and expand, eventually the config map, the malicious config map, will get picked up by all the uh, new uh, FluentBit pods. OK, so let's see the, this in action. All right, so we find ourselves in EKS cluster. We see that we have only one node for now, just easier that way. And in the plots, we can see that we have the fluent bit. Uh, there is, that it is. Now we are dumping the CMs. This is the fluent bit config. This is the CM that we're going to use. And Amazon CloudWatch is the def default namespace that I just followed the best EKS best pr pr practices guide to install this, uh, this daemon set. Uh, now, if we're taking the CM do, uh, and, look, uh, and dumping it, the, the pretty print doesn't know how to deal with that. It. It's, it's a known problem. Um, it hasn't been solved. However, when you added the CM, it's actually 
uh, printed pretty. So what we're doing here, we're adding it and adding that construct, input and output. And I'll, for the sake of time, I'll move up a bit and explain what happens here. So as an input, we define two commands, hostname and ID. Okay, and we can chain as many commands as we want. And this, they will get executed by the fluent bit every 10 seconds. So you, you, you might not see this, but this is 10. You give interval, and then you give output, what to do with this input. So in this case, the output of these commands will get sent to our C2 server, of course, to port 4444, um, and that's good enough for us. Okay, so we were able to, um, to update the config map, and now we're just waiting. What are we waiting for? The config map is not real time, right? The update doesn't work in real time. So we're waiting for a new node to get created and to pick it up, right? So in behind the scenes, to make it faster, I'm just, uh, I, uh, I'm increasing the number of nodes to two, and now I'm waiting for, uh, for another node to appear. And then hopefully, the, f the next fluent bit pod, because it's a daemon set, right? It will pick up the new config and it will execute whatever we ask from it. Okay, so there we go. We, we found the pod, and then we see the additional container created pod, this, this new fluent bit pod. Great. And because we define it every 10 seconds, so this, this, the commands should execute every 10 seconds. So in parallel, we are starting our C2 Python server, and there we go. There we get in the commands. And you see that fluent bit packs it really nicely. It just runs hostname, then runs ID, packs them as adjacent. It, we just can we, we can use the fluent bit functionality to retrieve to exfiltrate whatever data we want. All right. So this was the second use case. What happened here? Right. So our assumption, and I want to be very clear about our assumption. Our assumption was that we had a misconfiguration, some kind of config date, uh, config map update. Right. It happens. Um, we like. In this case, we were able to update the config map that uh, FluentBit is using, and uh, eventually all new nodes, because the production cluster grows and shrinks, right? It's, it's very dynamic. So eventually, if you think about it, all the new nodes uh, will have this turnover, and they will pick up the new config map. And we will achieve the all node persistent execution. So this is cool stuff, because it's resistant to restart, because config map is saved in its it's CD, right? So even if the if the nodes will get restarted or created new one, they will pick that malicious config file. And again, we are running underneath the uh, API server. Uh, admission controller is blind. There's no audit trace, and we probably bypass CDR because it all happens as a fluent bit. Now the impact is uh, limited by what fluent bit can do, but typically fluent bit knows can do uh, can uh, assemble collect tons of information because it's a it's a log management platform, so there are tons of host paths mapped into the fluent bit, so attacker can use that. All right, what can we do to reduce the risk? One, the, f the first thing, of course, uh, like, I don't know, use the security vendors. However, what's the problem with the security vendor vendors and control plane and middleware? They typically accept control plane and middleware components, right? either by the kube system or through the Kubernetes users or container image names. Some examples, gatekeeper flow that accept the kube system. Uh, this is, I think, tracer rule, right, that accepts flannel, D, kube proxy, et cetera, et cetera, based on the process name. And this is a Falco rule that accepts based on the uh, Kubernetes containers that are, this is a macro that defined elsewhere before in the file, um, just has a list of whitelisted cont uh, containers. So that's a problem. Okay, what else can we use? Well, let's use the fancy PSS, right? That's the PSP v2. Um, well, not so fast, because you can't apply PSS on the kube system namespace. 
and not just cube system namespace, but a couple more namespaces, like cube list public or something like this. So this is a problem. This is a problem because we know that many, many middleware components are being dumped automatically into the cube system namespace. On the other hand, we can't use our typical security controls, Kubernetes security controls. Okay, what else can we use? Well, let, let's try the user NS. This is also a new shiny feature. In V1.25, it became alpha. Um, so the, it basically limits the impact of the container escape so that now container uh, root is not a host root. So this is pretty cool. However, you can't use user namespaces on more than half of those components from the end Remember, on 13 out of 25, you can't use it. Why? Because there are certain conditions. There's a, like, we, we, we sketched this in, the, in our blog. There are certain conditions where you just can't use user NAS. And that's if you need, for example, access to resources that managed by the initial, one of the initial Linux uh, uh, namespaces. Because the thing with the user namespace is that it's very like, rigid and inflexible, so it's everything or nothing. So unfortunately, we probably won't be able to use it on the middleware. What else? Uh, how about we just remove all the middleware on the host level? Well, but then can't, you can't apply Kubernetes level security controls, right? And then they, they will probably get excluded from the EDRs as well. So th this is also not a great solution. What is a good solution? Well, it's not here, but first of all, don't try containers as root, right? We have, we, we keep in this mantra like er, multiple years, but still most of the containers are running as root because it's handy. But that uh, would probably stop the first attack. Right. The user won't be able, the attacker won't be able to write into the slash kit, if not true. Right? Um, in this case, this is a bit different what I want to, to show you with the core DNS. Core DNS has the same problem as uh, Fluent Git. It takes the config map. In the config map, in the core DNS config map, by the way, it's installed on all EKS uh, and AKS clusters by default. There's a plugin called on. Does anybody know about this? I didn't know. Um, so you can you can write something if if you if you can update the config map, you can do something like this: one startup, and then command execution. So that's a problem. However, it's not use case number three. Why? Because this doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because execu touch executable file not found. Who knows what's this? This means that Cordinus doesn't have bash execution context, because it's a slim container, makes slim images. It doesn't have the package manager as well. So this works. OK, two conclusions. Inclusive controls, right? We saw that our security controls don't take into account cube system and middleware, unfortunately. Uh, threat models, a word about threat models. If you remember, CNCF Financial Group created the trust boundaries right, and the um, attack trees for establishing persistence. You won't find middleware on those diagrams. It's all about proper control plane. Another prominent example is the trail of bit security audit, right? That's the components that they took a look. Do you see any middleware component? I don't see fluent bit here. I don't see no problem detector. But it's still running on every AKS and GK node. Some rethinking to do. Perhaps we need to rethink arbit permissions. So in my book, config maps update, it's very powerful. It's admin. Boom. Namespace update patch, power user, because then with just namespace, removing annotation on namespace and labels, you can remove the security control on any namespace. Perhaps we need to think about CSP-based mapping even. Um, rethinking Kubernetes detection. We need a multi-level approach. We saw that it's not just, it's, it's misconfiguration. Then you need to understand the ARBIC impact. And then you probably need log-based detection as well. And on top of that, you probably need agent-based dete detection as well, some kind of sensor to, to detect that no problem detector somehow, right? So you need this multi-level approach to the cluster. It's not just log, it's just one thing just won't work with these complex attacks. And eventually, rethinking CSP visibility. The ultimate question, what do we really have in our worker nodes? And I hope that this talk was kind of the first step towards answering this question. So that's all I had for today. Thank you so much for coming. I'll be happy to take questions if we have. Uh, if not, I'll just hang around here and I will be on Slack. Thank you. Thank you.